sense is great And my enemies were strong and Jesus showed me A perfect love When he laid upon that cross Let's pray again, Lord. Bless this time as we examine a new letter today. The letter to the Philippians. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take from it that which is needful for us. Lord, not selfishly, Lord, but ultimately that we may have the greatest impact in this world and that you may have the greatest impact in our lives. That's our simple prayer today, Lord. May you empower it by your Holy Spirit and deliver it to us. May we encourage one another in it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are going to be covering the letter from Paul to the church in Philippi today. <clears throat> my plan, my hope, is to cover all of chapter 1. But before that, I want to really just kind of basically bring you up to where Paul is at here. So you're looking at this letter being written around AD 62, right in and around there. This is 10 years out from that second missionary journey in Acts 16 where Paul goes to Philippi, where he had that early success in finding fellowship and, and hearts being one to Christ through Lydia and her family and, and the jailer and his family and in a really small, for a moment, church began. And it grew because it wasn't a work of man, but a work of God. See, Philippi was... An interesting region in the southeastern part of Europe, what we know today is northern Greece. It was right at the center point of the east-west corridor of trade. It is part of and one of the jewels on the road known as that Great Northern Highway. A lot of trade routes. Now, Philippi in and of itself was quite magnificent in that it had gold mines. And so it was a place where people came, they rested for a while, they maybe tried to establish a life, maybe even tried to get rich. But it was a point, a place, where people passed through. It had a great significance in history because <clears throat> the Roman Empire, as you know now, a hundred plus years into their reign, uh, prior to that in, in 42 BC, it was when the Roman Republic which had ruled from about 500 B.C. up to around 27 B.C. when it ultimately fell prey to the Roman Empire. There was a battle fought here in Philippi, and ultimately Alexander, which would represent that future Roman Empire, was established there, this Roman colony. See, many people don't know that the Roman Empire prior to that was a republic, that it in fact elected officials to represent the people. But it grew and grew. And in time, they recognized for all of the representation that we have, for the people, the working class, the elites, people are being represented, but our military needs to be ready at a moment's notice. So this Roman Republic which was in existence for, for 500 years, determined that should an enemy come and try to take back or infringe upon what Rome considered to be theirs, that they needed a dictator or somebody that was established as a leader for life that could get that army, get that military moving at a moment's notice. See, with a lot of representation, a lot of government... Uh, intrusion really into the lives of the people things become cumbersome we can see that we're living in the midst of that right now we have now a big government in this country and uh, it takes a lot to get a little done but they had determined we're in danger and if we don't have somebody that can be the one to say we're mobilizing then we're going to fall victim so they established what would ultimately be the republic's demise. Because with one person in power over a military, ultimately having control over the military meant that they controlled everything. And the republic gave way 
to an empire. It is in the midst of this empire and its beginnings that would go on until uh, 476 A.D., I believe, around there, that Paul is ministering. So you can imagine, because I think that for myself, maybe in just the simplicity of my own mind, I look at Paul's life and I see what the calling is for us to do, right? Go and make disciples. Jesus Christ said that. And then I have a tendency to look at the early apostles and the disciples based upon where my life is at. Almost like all throughout history, it was the freedom that we experience in America. And it wasn't the case. I don't have a lot of fear of what man may do to me right now based upon my Christian faith. But Paul lived in a different time. And as this Roman Empire grew, Paul became a problem. See, the power that Paul had was not in and of himself. In fact, God made sure that everyone knew it wasn't Paul and his power. Not only was he afflicted with what many believe to be uh, malaria and the, the after effects of that as he ministered in those areas where there was swamp and sickness, he had also been maimed and he had been beat up for his faith so that he had a stutter, he had eye issues, he had, he had a great multitude of things that ultimately would cause the person speaking to him to say, this man is not powerful at all. There is nothing within this man that is going to be a threat to the Roman Empire. But what many couldn't see was that what was within him was, in fact, power indeed. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God himself, empowering, moving in Paul, taking him to places that were of you know, great importance to an empire. Philippi being one of those places. But God moved. And God is moving in our lives as well. And I know that you're willing to receive that. I know that our prayer as a church is, Lord, show me what I may do daily, weekly, with my life so that I may be of the most use. Right? For this church to be 10 years out and to see that the one that began it all for him is in a prison in Rome, it was a test of their faith. Because it's completely backwards from the world's idea of success. Who wants to follow a person that says this is the way and it lands him in jail? Right? Doesn't seem very successful, does it? But they had the wisdom they had the discernment. They had been led by God, and not necessarily Paul, but Paul's God through Paul, to be able to weather this storm. And they didn't just weather it. They thrived in it. They sent ministers to Paul. They sent gifts to Paul. Twice when he was in Thessalonica. Once when he was in Corinth. And here, as he's in a jail in Rome, they send not only financial help, they send what many believe is their main pastor, their head pastor, Epaphroditus. They send him to minister to Paul to make sure that Paul's time in jail is as comfortable as it can be so that he may be able to continue to witness. That's the strength within Philippi. This pastor, Epaphroditus, in chapter 2 tells us that he almost died doing this. Not from threat of the Roman guard, but illness but God restored him. He didn't just restore him, he restored him and he brought this letter that Paul had written to give to him to, to deliver to this church. See, God is at work in all of this. Paul imprisoned, their head pastor, sick to the point of death, and yet God's word is delivered to encourage a people in such a vital area in Europe that to this day, we can look back and say there was a profound change that happened right here in history. And it wasn't the magnificence of Paul, it was the power of his God. That same God resides within you, believer, today. 
So within Philippians, in fact, the first chapter, there are really three things that Paul focuses in on. The things that he focus, focuses in on are the things that we ought to take to heart today. And what he does is he breaks down the first part of this letter by focusing on praise. Praise for what the church in Philippi has done and who they are. And then he focuses on prayer. Prayer for their continued success and the things that they may be lacking. And then he focuses on presentation. Now presentation is an interesting one because it goes both ways. He encourages them to make sure that their lives are lived out in such a way that would reflect good character, good conduct, walking in the light, the fact that there was something different than the rest of the world that was residing within the Christian. But also that presentation of his own life. And he uses his own life as an example of how to live. Right. So, praise, prayer, and presentation. And that's something that today, as we dig into chapter 1, we're going to look at in detail how we might glean from this and walk in that same way. Praise to God. Praise to those around us who are doing God's work, building people up. Right, That gets rid of selfishness real quick, doesn't it? Prayer. Prayer for continued success. And also prayer for those things that are needful that we see in our midst. In presentation, how we live out this faith. See, this letter, or this theme, because most letters have a theme, and some of the letters that Paul has written are rebukes because of love. He wants them to be successful, not in a worldly sense, but in a godly sense. But here, it's a different type of theme. If there is any theme at all, Really what he is explaining to them and ultimately to us today is how to live this Christian life. And I think most of us gather together how to live this out, but it's always a good reminder. It's always a good reminder of how to walk as Christians in this world. Make note, when the Philippian church heard of Paul's imprisonment, they didn't give up. They didn't think our leader has led us astray. They strengthened and they encouraged and they they endured. So, these hardships which Paul is facing, they had a tendency to do something. And hardships have a tendency to either make you bitter or to make you better. Right? And I'm not trying to give these little sound bites today, right? And that's not what I'm saying or trying to do. That's the reality. It's one or the other. Hardships can make you bitter or they'll make you better. And for Paul, it was vitally important that they understood that his joy in them and ultimately in the Lord couldn't be touched by anything in this world. That's a great encouragement. Because I think there's a tendency... I always say that, and maybe I'm the only one. Like, Pray for me if I'm up here saying, I think there's a tendency, and you're all looking at me like, that is not at all the way I'm dealing with things. Right? If I'm alone in this, then pray for me, would you please? But I think in my life, I have this I don't know, a tendency to, to kind of like say I'm going to fix things. I recognize things that aren't right in my life. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to eat better. I'm not, not, I'm not going to procrastinate anymore. I'm getting up early. Right? I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to worry less. Ha, famous words, right? Not so easy to live out. But that's the tendency, I think, of, of the, the human living in this world is to recognize, oh, I'm sick of this. I need to do this. And so therefore, I'm going to just make a plan. I'm going to write it out. I'm going to eat better. No sugar, only salad. Right? Yeah, right, exactly. Failure abounds. (laughs) Right? Being proactive. I'm getting up. I'm getting up at four. I'm going to get up at four. I'm going to get in the Word. I'm going to clean. I'm going to do everything I need to do. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be available. 
I'm going to worry less. And then what happens? I'm going to worry less, and then, and then the world just comes in and just kicks you. The bills pile in. Unforeseen circumstances come in. And everything you're trying not to do, you begin to do. You start to worry. With me, this is the pattern. I worry, I stop being proactive, and I become reactive, and then I eat more. <laughs> that's, my, that's my whole realm of my life, right? Or you can skip the proactive. I worry, I eat more, right? <laughs> that's basically my life. And so then I think I can fix this, I'm going to fix this, and this is how I'm going to fix this. And what happens? We begin to treat the symptoms. You hear that? We begin to treat the symptoms. We're not getting to the root of things. I'm not getting to the root of what's going on. So, as we begin to treat just the symptoms of the sickness, we get discouraged and we fall back into the vice. Which just compounds and compounds. So, when Paul thanks God for the Philippians and he counts it joy that the world can't touch, though he faces a prison sentence, which is eventually, and he knows it, going to be his death, he can look past all of the things like the worry, the procrastination, the healthy lifestyle, right? Because he gets to the root of it. My joy is not wrapped up in the things of this world. And because they're not wrapped up in the things of this world, but in God, then I can have victory in all of these things I'm struggling in. I do become proactive because I'm dealing with the root of it. I desire to be in the Word, around God, doing that which God has wanted me to do. To go and bless others. To, to live a life that is selfless. If I'm selfless, then I'm worrying less. Right? If I look at this body as a temple and I'm not worrying, then I'm going to have a tendency to have success in all other areas of my life because I'm dealing with the root of it. The world can't touch my joy as a Christian. And this is where Paul is focused at. So as Paul's letter focuses on these three things, praise, prayer, and presentation, he begins. Paul and Timothy. Bond servants of Jesus Christ. Now you understand that Timothy is not here with him, but Timothy is going to play a big part in this church. Paul knows that. Paul is going to present to them Timothy, who he hopes to bring in ultimately to bless this church, right? But he includes him. Bond servants of Jesus Christ. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this introduction is, is pretty basic. He says Paul, you remember if you've gone through Acts with us, that there was a time when, when Paul was named Saul. Paul is his Greek name. Saul is his Hebrew name. Paul has been commissioned to go and reach the Gentile people, the Greeks. And so here Paul says to all the saints in Christ Jesus, with bishops and deacons, right? So overseers, bishops, elders, right? Those that would attend to the, the word and the needs of the flock in that way, their spiritual needs, and then also the deacons, those that have obligations when the congregation gathers together or meeting the needs and, and uh, you know, maybe feeding the poor amongst the congregation or, or setting up those things that they can help and, and do outreach. And so, Excuse me, before, before we know the peace of God, we have to fully understand the grace of God. right? If we don't understand the grace of God, if we don't receive the grace of God, we're not going to have the peace of God. So grace and peace. Grace first. And then genuine peace. We have to respond to God's grace. And then he begins. right? So, so praise, right? Prayer. And also presentation. And in verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy, for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. 
being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So the first praise is that he's mentioning their constant witness. He's in the thick of it. He recognizes that even though he's in jail, the work of spreading the gospel continues and they have been faithful to do so. So he's saying your constant witness is strengthening me and you're reaching into the world with the good news. So he's praising them for that. That's something that we can take from. That's something that we can learn from right here. Their constant witness, right? Ten years of being together has landed Paul in jail and they are strengthening Paul and they are strengthening the believers in that church and they are a vital outreach to their community. They gave them themselves and they shared all things with Paul. From the first day, it says, they trusted and they received immediate fellowship in Christ. In fact, Paul says, I'm I'm confident, I'm being confident, perfect tense here. I'm confident of this very thing. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Can I just go back to something real quick? And I, I talked to my dear brother last week about this. It was so great to see him. I don't want to embarrass him, but my brother John uh, Nesbitt, who's here, um, there was a time, and, and you, you guys remember this story, I'm sure, if you weren't sleeping during the message, that there was a time when I couldn't speak in front of more than two or three people, right? You know the story. You know how blunt I was with God as I was leading worship, but then I couldn't lead worship right up to the time I'm supposed to lead worship, and I had to back out. I would make myself physically ill, right? And then Sunday evenings, 10 people at church, same thing, to the point where it got to the point where I said, Lord, if you don't take this from me, I cannot do this. You're calling, if you're calling me to it, then you've got to help me through it. You've got to take this anxiety away from me. Well, you remember I told you that there was a man, a gentleman who would, would be just, all of this would be thrown upon him with like five minutes to go before church started, right? Because I couldn't do it. <laughs> well, he's in attendance with us. He was here Sunday. He's here today. And he blesses me. This, this brother here, John, he looks, we're looking a lot alike these days, brother. <laughs> this was the guy. The encouragement when he walked through the door All of that testimony in my life came right back to the forefront. And I remembered there was faithfulness of brothers to do the hard thing when I couldn't do it. When I was failing, he was picking me up. When I couldn't make it happen, there wasn't judgment or condemnation. There was, there'll be a time. Let me take it from here. The strength of solid brothers and sisters in our midst help us through these very difficult times in our lives. Then you know the rest of the story that ultimately the Lord just just took it. He took the anxiety. He took it away. So that today, I don't know, maybe there's remnants here and there of it, but you probably wouldn't think based upon our relationship with one another and my communication with you that that was ever a thing I struggled with in my past. It was seeing Christ in a brother of mine helping me through a difficult time which ultimately led me to the place where God says, this is what I have for you. And here's how we're going to do this. Right? Never underestimate what Paul is saying here about the confidence he has that he who has begun a good work will complete it. We're on a journey. We may not feel as though we are strong enough to do what is being called of us right now, But that doesn't just cause us to be able to neglect the responsibility. The commission is the same. Go and make disciples, Lord, wherever you would have me. If going and making disciples means that you serve in children's ministry until the Lord calls you home, which I, to this day, feel as though is the most vital ministry we have at this church, that's where the battle is at. Or it's some thankless job like standing up here behind the pulpit. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) But in reality, wherever God has you, that was a joke, by the way, and a a poor one at that. I am so blessed and humbled by the opportunity, right? But Paul is confident. 
He's looking at people, probably thinking of people in that midst. Hey, he begun a good work in you. He's going to be faithful to complete it. Don't give up. Don't give up, right? Weak, worn out, tired Christians, don't, don't give up. God began it. God will be faithful to complete it. Continue to walk in it. Strengthen one another. It's needful. So he praises them for that. Both for those that are just barely hanging on and those that are making sure that everybody's hanging on. And then in verse 7, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Right? Praise for their concern for the gospel. That's what unites them. He's praising them in this. Their constant witness in their lives and then their concern for the gospel. And in verse 8, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. What is he saying? He's saying, I see Christ Jesus in you. I love him. I love him in you. He's praising them for that. From there, he goes from praise to prayer. And in verse 9, he says, In this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Verse 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So he's saying, my prayer is that love that you have, that example that you are, that needs to just overflow. My prayer is that that love given to you, imparted by God, just overflows like a flood from your life into your immediate group, out into the community, wherever the Lord desires that you minister. Let love for other believers run over. Let it flood into everything. That's that's his prayer. Because he recognizes you're doing it now But the world has a way to get in, and it can divide, and it can conquer quite easily. And the next thing you know, everyone's bitter, and they don't want to be around one another, and then everything just disperses. He's saying, that love, let it continue to overflow. Let that brotherly love be the thing that runs over. The interesting thing here is he's not just saying, let your love abound more and more for your brothers? He's saying, let that love grow up spiritually. Hear me in this. Let your love grow up so that you have discernment and knowledge of what it is that those around you need. Not just love abounding and pouring out and gushing over people, but love that grows up into a knowledge and a discernment A very wise love that knows right where to minister to have the greatest, most loving, powerful effect on those around you. See, there's a difference there. That it may grow in insight. It may be filled with knowledge. Let that love overflow, but let it be discerning. Let it be insightful. Let the power be in the knowledge from God, the wisdom from God. It's an educated love. It's a grown-up love. It's, it's more powerful than anything else. Verse 11, being filled with the fruits, again, this is prayer, with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise of God. Right. So he's praying. He's praying for that fruit of righteousness. And what is it really? It is Christ living in and through us. And so, this is why he is praying, let God be magnified in you. Let that fruit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, really, the character and the person of Jesus, let God be magnified. His prayer is that fruit of righteousness be continuously magnified and shown forth in them. And that is God himself then from there he moves so we've covered praise prayer and now we're for the last part of this chapter it's the presentation and paul's going to talk a little bit about his life he's going to talk a bit about the encouragement he finds in the philippian church and he says in verse 12 
But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. Some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. So Paul is here a living example, and he's an encouragement. His chains and the things that have befallen him are actually furthering the gospel. He's got opportunity. He's got somebody chained to him. Imagine being, imagine being an atheist, an agnostic, anybody other than a Christian, and having to take the job of being chained to the Apostle Paul in prison. That's what they did. You're going to be witnessed to constantly. You're going to be prayed over, loved upon, in a way, it's going to be the easiest and the most difficult job you've ever had. Because you're hearing something that you're probably thinking, I don't want to hear it. But you have somebody that cares for you more than any other prisoner has ever cared for somebody. That they would be willing to, to lay down their life in obedience so that maybe the prison staff may know Jesus Christ. In the midst of evil. In the midst of those that would undermine I said at the beginning that the world that we live in, this nation, is quite different than what Paul was experiencing. But there'll still be people that try to undermine. Shouldn't be so within the church community, but unfortunately it is. People have to grow up in maturity, and sometimes we're on that road with them. Sometimes we experience the pain of people's immaturity, even amongst brothers and sisters. But Paul, what he's saying here, he's, he's not saying the Judaizers that are trying to get people to go back to the old way. He's not saying those that are preaching a false gospel. He called those people out. He's saying people that are preaching the word but do not like Paul specifically. To me, that's the most painful thing. Because they're supposed to be together. They're supposed to be working in a way that glorifies God, but there are people, even believers, that are undermining what Paul is doing because they don't like Paul. That's powerful. They're promoting self, and they're slamming Paul's ministry because theirs doesn't look as good. That's immature. If you see that, take the road of Paul. Because that's the mature path. Be careful. So, <clears throat> in verse 19, Paul continues that presentation. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He's going to talk about where he's currently at. According, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed... But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, Right? Psalm, the psalmist in Psalm 16 said that. Paul said it himself in the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5. Everybody knows what is better, but Paul knows what's needful right now, knowing that what's to come is truly rest, but right now there's a furtherance that needs to happen. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. It's almost as if Paul is saying, in this world, I've been broken, and I've been molded into that image. And at any other time that's spent on this earth is not necessarily to make me something, 
but is more needful for you. And he's not saying that in a way that is overconfident or bragging. He's not saying, I'm here, you're there. He's recognizing, Lord, I've been through it, and I love you, and my joy is there. You've, you've thrown everything at me, and you've never left me. I get it. And now there are people here, and if you're keeping me here for any reason, it must be that there are others that need to be strengthened. That heart of a selfless servant like Paul is something that we can take and just grow upon, I trust. Nevertheless, 24, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. So really, what he's saying there, my, my current chains and my future deliverance is what he's talking about. And there's going to come a time, whether he's delivered from those chains or he's delivered from the chains of this earthly body. Ultimately, he's okay with whatever it is, but while he's here, he's going to live his life so that others may grow up in Christ. Through all these difficulties, through all the difficulties that Paul faced, nothing could take that joy away because it wasn't founded in this world. He had love for the church in Philippi. He had love for the various places that he had established. He even had love for the Corinthians, which is just, they got it so wrong, and he loved them so dearly. But he experienced a lot of pain because of them. Their indecision, and ultimately their decisions to do contrary to what Paul was teaching. But in the end, nothing could take away from that joy because that joy of his salvation was something that was from God and would be fully realized when these chains were broken from earthly to the spiritual realm. And that kept him on a firm foundation. Nothing could shake him. He lived it out. That's the presentation. And finally, he says in verse 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries which is to them proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here was in me. So Paul closes out this portion of the letter, not that he broke it into chapters, but this thought is complete, and the fact that the presentation of his life should encourage them to walk worthy and in a way that causes others to come to Christ. You see, there is a, a divine getting out of the way that happens when we begin to realize that this is actually what it's about. And people will confuse. They will. Their whole, your whole life, if you walk in this way, they're going to constantly mistake meekness for weakness in your life. They will. They'll look at you and think that you're weak, that you're completely passive, that you just will lay down at any turn, that, you, right, that you're not going to fight the battle. And that's not the case at all. But meekness is really having a great self-control over this flesh to say, is this ultimately going to further the gospel or is it going to further my cause? Because if you can control that, and the only way to control that is by that fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit within you, then what you're going to find is your life, though the circumstances of it may either not change for the better or may even get worse, you ultimately have something within you that causes you to continuously be an effective minister while you're here on this earth, for the furtherance of God's kingdom. And if we're talking today about the serious Christian walk, then this is the root of it. We find everything else, the symptoms of the flesh, 
of falling short. We find all of these symptoms. We don't have to address them. We just have to get to the root of what it is to walk the Christian life, who it is we're following, and why. And that grace and that peace that Paul talks about and the praise for the things that are right and the prayers that he talks about, the love overflowing and how it is mature and growing and and it needs to continue to be formed in unity and then the presentation of this walk because of all of those things are really just a practical guide for us to get to the root of any problem and to overcome it by what God has made us. Amen? All right, well, Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank, thank you for uh, this chapter. Lord, thank you that Paul presents a sincere presentation of his life, his conduct. Thank you that you ultimately came and lived out this walk, knowing all of the things that can entangle us in this world. Lord, our prayer, my prayer, Let our conduct and our hearts be worthy of the gospel of Christ. May we all stand fast in one spirit and one mind together for the faith of the gospel. Not terrified by adversaries, not terrified by adversaries of the flesh, not terrified by adversaries of the circumstances that surround us, but having our faith rooted and grounded in you that is untouchable by anything in this world has to offer. Let us continue not only to grow up, but to have great victory in those things which we are longing for victory in. Bless us and cover us as we go from here. Lead us in your ways, Lord. And uh, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you, church.